fans, and welcome to another episode of High and Tight. I'm John Nolan, the PBR Virginia, D.C. content manager and the Northern Virginia scouting director. With me, as always, is Jason Burton, the PBR Virginia, D.C. scouting director, coming to you from outside of the Richmond area. Burton, it's playoff week. Um, pretty sure you're going to end up at Shepherd Stadium sometime this weekend. Uh, what's the food choice going to be down there for you? I mean, that's a that's a packed day, so that's just like a Wawa sub. Sometimes a Wawa sub goes pretty far, I'll be honest with you. So, as I mentioned, this week officially marks the midpoint of May. As we're recording this, it's the 14th. You guys will probably see this on the 15th or 16th, um, which means it's playoff time now for most of the Commonwealth and D.C. The WCAC crowned their champ on Sunday afternoon. BISA announced his state tournament field, as did DCSAA. Um, many public schools right now are in district tournament play. The weather is finally not cold and terrible. So hopefully it stays as nice as, as it looks like it's going to be this week. It's a great time to be a baseball fan in Virginia and D.C. if you're into high school baseball. And so in this episode, we're going to name the team of the week. We're going to name a player of the week. And we're going to take a quick look at our updated 2025 player rankings, which will start rolling here on Monday. And then we're going to tell you everything you ever care to know about, about the VISA and DCSA state tournaments that are coming up this week. So let's go ahead and go straight to our team of the week and our team of the week here for week nine, St. John's College. Congratulations to St. John's after one year of not being the WCAC champs. They are the WCAC champs here for 2023. Um, they swept the championship series against Gonzaga, 12 to four win on Friday, a six to one win on Sunday. Um, they also took two out of three from PVI earlier in the week, actually suffering their first loss of the season in game two, which we'll come back to here in a second. Um, so St. John's season is over. I believe that record is 31 and one on the season, right, Bert? Yep. 30 wins, one loss to PVI, and then a tie with uh, Archbishop Spalding. I think that game was called due to weather on a Saturday. That sounds correct. So, Pretty good season there for the cadets back as the WCAC champs. Um, pretty dominating performance there in those wins over Gonzaga. So congratulations to them. I do want to throw a hat tip out to Potomac School, um, which won their conference on. Um, and Potomac School is going to advance to the VISA playoffs. We'll see them hopefully here this week. Um, so a hat tip to them. And let's go ahead and move on to our player of the week. And our player of the week for week nine is St. Paul the sixth freshman, so the 2026 Carter Purdue. Purdue had a stellar outing against St. John's on Tuesday in what was an elimination game for Paul the sixth at the time, um, and actually handed St. John's their first and only loss of the season. So Purdue was spectacular for PVI in that game, and he's going to get to go ahead and wear the distinction of being the only guy to beat St. John's this year. Bert, you were at that game. Why don't you talk about Carter a bit? Yeah, it was, uh, obviously it was a really good outing from the freshman. Uh, he came in in the second, was in a tough situation, worked his way out of it. Uh, it's a 6-3 righty, pitches with a little bit of effort, pitches with some energy, poise. Um, you know, he got himself into some situations with multiple runners on base and nobody out or one out uh, and worked his way out, made some big pitches in some big situations. Uh, he was in the 80-83 range. Uh there towards the end, he was like 79, 88, you know, 80, 79, 81, 80, 81, right in there. Uh, threw the slider for strikes, started using the slider a little bit deeper into the game, a little bit more frequently. Um, but he just, the biggest thing is he just competed. He just competed. He kept uh, PVI in the game. He allowed his defense to work. They made some nice plays behind him, especially on some ground balls. I think it was two or three double plays that they turned. Uh, he had a big strikeout or two. Um, like I said, it was just, honestly, it wasn't like overpowering stuff. Um, it was really good stuff for a freshman, um, but probably more so than, than anything. It was just the moxie and poise that he showed on the mound. That's outstanding. And again, congratulations to Carter Purdue, 2026 from St. Paul the Sixth High School in Northern Virginia, your player of the week for week nine. I do want to throw a hat tip to Mason Self, uh, 2023 from Blacksburg High School, or not from Blacksburg from Christiansburg High School. He had two home runs on Friday in their game against Blacksburg, as well as a double, which was our runner-up option here for Player of the Week. 
So let's go ahead and keep moving here. And just like last week, we updated the 2024 player rankings in Virginia, D.C. This week, as promised, we're doing the 2025 rankings. So our updated 2025 rankings are going to roll on the website all week. Um, real quickly, let me go ahead and run down the top 10 for you in the number one spot. Evan Hankins, the left-handed pitcher from John Battle, Tennessee commit. Number two, Noe Yoder, right-handed pitcher at Atlee. He's a Duke commit. Number three, Donovan Jeffrey, first baseman, right-handed pitcher from Manchester High School and a Miami commit. Number four, Austin Dean is a left-handed pitcher from Bishop Ireton, a Virginia Tech commit. Number five, Luke Smyers, a left-handed pitcher from Mills Godwin, an Alabama commit. Number six is Patrick Dudley, a left-handed pitcher from Atlantic Shores Christian, a South Carolina commit. At number seven is Ethan Ball, a shortstop from McLean High School, a Virginia Tech commit. Number eight is Brett Beasley, a shortstop from Atlantic Shores Christian, an East Carolina commit. Number nine, Miles Upchurch, right-handed pitcher from St. Albans School, a Maryland commit. And lastly, at number 10, Grady Lenahan, an outfielder from Patriot High School, also an East Carolina commit. So that's our new top 10 throughout the week. We are going to go ahead and run a bunch of stories focusing on the players that are in the rankings um, with the rankings overall, as well as big risers and new faces. So let's take a second here and talk about some of our big risers. Um, this story will be running later on in the week. Uh, Jason, do you want to go ahead and talk about one of the big risers in our new rankings? Yeah, we should probably talk about the fact of East Carolina has four commits inside the top 25 of the 25 class. Uh, so they're, they're doing well in the state and just got another, what, another commit in state of 26 with Jason Khrushchev. Um, so they're, they're, they're doing well in, in the state of Virginia right now. Um, yeah. pirate nation here in Virginia, apparently. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Yoder, uh, he didn't make a huge jump in terms of like 50, 60, 70 spots, like some other guys. Um, but anytime you're inside of the top 15, top 20, and you make a double digit jump or, you know, uh, that's a pretty sizable thing, uh, pretty big feat. Um, so Noah climbed from number 16 to number two. Uh, he started off at number 26 in April of last year. Uh, he is a big, strong right-handed pitcher. Um, you know, he's six, four, right at, right in that territory. Um, long limbs filled out pretty well. Uh, he was up to 94 in front of uh, Jordan, one of our ground forces guys, uh, and an absolute gem that he threw. I think that game was like six and two thirds, yeah, six and two thirds, 11 strikeouts up to 94. Um, <clears throat> big breaking ball, 76, 79, kind of power curveball. Uh, I saw him March, he was 92. I saw him this fall. He was like 91. Um, it's pretty raw, uh, but that's probably the most intriguing thing about it is how raw it is. Uh, it's a lot coming at you. It's uncomfortable at bats. Uh, he gets swings and misses with the fastball. And and that's, you know, when you look at a lot of guys, like, do they just miss bats? And I think that's the most important thing watching some of these arms uh, is can they compete in the zone and, and beat people uh, with the stuff that they have as opposed to, you know, make, getting guys chased and stuff like that. So uh, big riser, Noah Yoder, uh, high ceiling. I'm going to be a guy to watch long-term for sure. Absolutely. And we had Noah Yoder was actually, I'm pretty sure, player of the week um, about a month ago for the game in question. Had a chance to interview him. So that's on a couple pods ago. All right. So that is the big riser we're going to talk about. Look for more in a couple of stories, I believe, if I heard you correctly. Um, that will run on the website this week. Also, because 2025s are sophomores, we are generally expanding the rankings while we update them. So there are going to be some new faces into the rankings that will also drop this week as a story. Bert, is there one you want to highlight real quickly here in the new faces category? It is. Uh, Thomas Conrad, he has, he has exploded really this spring for Greenbrier. Um, athletic infielder. Uh, I think we have him listed as an outfielder. He he plays uh, he plays third base for Greenbrier Christian. 6'1", 180 pounds, lean strength, twitchy, hand speed, bat speed. Uh, I went to see him, I guess, a week or so ago, uh, Greenbrier and Western Branch, 
and he really jumped out just how he handles himself. He's got some positional versatility. Again, he's athletic. He's probably an average above average runner. Um, but there's, there's some juice in that bat. And like I said, he's, he's versatile. He's athletic. The body's going to fill out well. Um, I just think there's some upside with this one. Uh, and again, that's a new face coming into the 25 class, Thomas Conrad. All right. Thank you, Bert. Um, make sure you guys are checking out the updated rankings. Um, like we said, we had 2024s last week. We'll have 2026s next week, and then we'll cycle back to the 2023s the week after that. So keep an eye out for those. And now let's go ahead and move towards, let's be honest, what is everyone's favorite time, which is postseason time here. Um, this weekend, we've had a pair of organizations drop their playoff brackets of uh, Virginia Independent Schools Athletic Association and the D.C. State Athletic Association. So we've got the VISA playoffs. We've got the D.C. State Championship playoffs all occurring this weekend, shaping up towards crowning some champs next weekend here. Um, VISA going to be at Shepherd Stadium on Saturday, the 20th. Uh, DCSAA currently scheduled to crown their champ on Sunday, the 21st at Nats Academy. We want to go ahead and take a peek at these brackets here real quickly and probably spend entirely too much time talking about what we think is going to happen because this is a lot of fun for us. So I'm going to read the bracket real quickly. I'm going to ask Jason who his pick is, and the two of us are going to go back and forth about them for hopefully not too long, but let's be real. It's going to happen. So VISA is where we're going to start, and we're going to start with VISA Division One. In VISA Division One, the number one seed in the playoffs is Benedictine. They will play the winner of the 8-9 game, which is St. Stephen's and St. Agnes and Miller School. Um, the Four five game in that is St. Paul the Sixth and Potomac School. Number three is Collegiate taking on number six Bishop O'Connell. Number two is Cape Henry Collegiate taking on number seven St. Christopher's. And those quarterfinal games are scheduled for Tuesday with the semifinals set for Friday in the championship, obviously on Saturday. So Bert, who do you think's winning? Is it chalk or is it something else? Uh, you know, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, Benedictine is, is set up pretty well, obviously because they're the one seed and they, they have to play the second game or what will be the second game, you know, for St. Stephen, St. Agnes or Miller school. Um, you know, so they get a, they get one of their second secondary arms. Um, honestly, I think Paul, the six and Potomac school could go a couple of different ways. Potomac School has played really, really well uh, this spring. Can they hold the Paul the Six offense down? And and honestly, I think there's there's been some ups and downs uh, with with Eisenreich uh, this spring, and he's been really, really good at times. Um, he's gotten hit a little bit at times, uh, but the stuff is there. The stuff is electric. Um, if if he's good versus Potomac School, they advance. Then my question is, who do they throw versus Benedictine in that second game? Um, that might be where we come back to Purdue, our uh, player of the week right there, right? For sure, for sure. Um, you know, I don't want to throw too much on Carter's plate so soon. Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know how long he's been up on varsity. I'm not sure of that. Um, I All right, we well, what about on the other side? I think we were looking at O'Connell has their big arm, the 26 you mentioned, who just committed to East Carolina, Khrushchev. Is their probable starter against collegiate? Does that feel a little upsetty or not? I, uh, it, it definitely has the potential to be. I think the the place where Bishop O'Connell has struggled this year is producing offense, and collegiate it can be really good offensively. I think if if they can get four or five innings out of Cruz Check and he gives up one or two runs, then obviously they're going to be in the ball game in some capacity. If Collegiate comes out hot and runs him early, uh, I, I don't see them slowing down after that. But O'Connell also has, you know, A.J. Murray and Jack Rampey and some other guys behind him. Uh, they're a sound team. They play really well. Um, but, again, I think the offense has been a struggle at times this year, and they're going up against a, one of the better offensive teams in the area. Yeah, that uh, definitely stands in line with what I saw when I went and saw O'Connell actually earlier this week against Gonzaga. Um, Murray pitched pretty well, but their bats just had absolutely nothing going. Um, so who do you think ends up being our VISA Division One state champ this year? Hmm. 
That's a tough one. I'm gonna be honest. That's that's tough this year. Uh, well, that's why we pay you the big bucks, there, big guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> um, I think Kate gets by St. Chris uh, because St. Chris doesn't have a front line arm, and Kate can be really good offensively. Um, and honestly, Collegiate doesn't have a shutdown arm. I would imagine they're going to have to roll Rollison uh, against Bishop O'Connell because that's going to be a tough game. Um, so I see, I, I know it's chalky, but I do see Cape coming out of the bottom, but collegiate scores runs. Um, and, and honestly, Cape doesn't have like a, a true frontline arm either. Um, that's just going to be basically who can get to 10 runs first, I think. So I was about to say that Friday, that Friday semifinal game sounds like it's going to be a, a doozy. I'm going to go, ah, uh, but St. Chris played Cape really well earlier this year. I think it was like a one nothing, two nothing game. It was really early. Um, I'm gonna go Cape and Collegiate. I know that's chalk, but yeah, I'm just going one and two. I'm going Benedictine and Cape in the final. That's so like that's so bad. Yeah, but sometimes that's the way it is. And I'm uh, honest with you, I kind of see that too. Just as I'm thinking about it, my. And I say sleeper, like it's not some big sleeper, but uh, my sleeper, I'm I'm sticking with what I said at the beginning of the year. Collegiate, collegiate's my underdog here. Right, I think O'Connell, if the Pats could figure it out or go hot for a week, they have the arms where they could be an interesting pick here. But I really do think we're a little chalky, and I know personally, I I, I actually do think Benedictine ends up as your state champ. Just make sure you don't count out Owen Peterson in Potomac School. <laughs> this oh is God. true. I mean, I, I'm actually probably going to be at that game on Tuesday night, so um, we'll see. There, there's definitely a chance for Potomac School. They've, they've won a lot of games this year, so we'll see how that goes against Paul the Six and possibly against Benedictine after that. All right, so that's Division One. Let's go ahead and move on to Vista Division Two. Um, Vista Division Two, your top seed in the tournament is Highland School. Uh, they will play the winner of the 8-9 game, which is Isle of Wight Academy against Covenant. Uh, the number four seed is Stewart playing number five seed Atlantic Shores Christian on the other side of the bracket. You've got number three seed Nanceman Suffolk Academy playing number six Virginia Episcopal School. Um, and then you have number two Greenbrier Christian Academy playing number seven North Cross. So I guess, Bert, the real question here is, does this just end up being the latest edition of Highland versus Greenbrier Christian for the state championship, or is there something that could get funky here? I'm gonna catch a lot of I'm gonna catch a lot of beef for this one. Um, oh boy, I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I look. <clears throat> Greenbrier Christian is talented. Um, they should be able to get through North Cross uh, without using. Um, some of their, you know, more dependable arms. Um, if they can do that, then I think they have a good chance. I would honestly say, and I know it's a 3-6, so it makes sense, Nansman Suffolk's going to have a more difficult time in that first game, and they're going to have to burn some arms. Uh, but Nansman Suffolk is also fairly offensive. Um, I think that, again, if Greenbrier can get through without burning a bunch of their good arms, I think it sets them up um, to take care of Nansman Suffolk in the second game. Uh, but I think a lot of it depends on just, honestly, how the pitching goes that first round. Um, yeah. Shores and Stewart. Shores and Stewart. Why do um, I think but, that's got to uh, be Shores that wins that game? Yeah, I mean, like, if 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 Patrick Dudley shows up on Tuesday and he's got his, and he's got his stuff, like – Shores is probably coming out because they're going to get five innings. If he's on and he has his stuff, they're going to get five or so innings of shutout one run ball. Uh, but do not count out Bruce Seacrest. Do not count out Bruce Seacrest and Stewart for the past, for I think it's two of the past three years, they have been underdogs. They have been in the semis and they have been up by five, six, seven, eight, nine runs in that semi game. It has slipped away both times. Uh, I would not count them out. Those dudes just find a way to stay in games. Sometimes that's all it takes in a tournament. You just blink and it's the sixth inning and then anything can happen. 
So um, where are we thinking? I, I know Highland's been playing better of late than maybe they were when we saw them um, at the spring break at the Commonwealth Classic. Do we, do we think the Hawks are going to repeat, or we think this is going somewhere else? I, I think the Hawks are going to get there um, just because I think that Shores and Stewart's going to be a, a battle to the death uh, on <laughs> Tuesday. And I think they're just going to torch those those first couple arms. And I think, you know, Highland has a chance – if their offense is is rolling, they have a chance to run away with that semifinal game. Um, I just don't think either of the other teams have enough offense to keep up with them. Um, and I think it's uh, the same thing on that semifinal on the bottom. Uh, I think it's going to be NSA and Greenbrier. And like I said, that's going to be a battle to the death um, because that's, you know, a little beach rivalry kind of deal. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they're going to torch some arms and have to roll them back the next day. And I just have a feeling Highland is set up better with, with the arms. I know that they're lacking some arm depth that, that, you know, that's down a little bit. Um, but I still think they have the depth overall on that roster to make that happen. I I think, I think I actually do agree with you and I think it makes sense. They're going to benefit from Covenant and Isle of Wight having to burn arms to get to them, so they probably roll through that game. Shores and Stewart are going to have to, like you said, it's going to be a war. They're going to have to beat each other up and burn through their arms. And then the same thing on Friday, you're going to have potentially NSA and Greenbrier doing the same thing. Like the, the Highland could almost not literally coast, but could be looking up in the championship game with the best arm situation. Um, at that point in time, which makes it really hard to pick against them. Although I'm sure that since we just said that, we probably just ruined them. Sorry, right, Lucia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who's uh, who's your underdog? Oh, I'm my a- underdog here? So that way I don't get badgered. So you don't get badgered about it? Uh, my underdog <laughs> here, that, that Nanceman Suffolk team's a little scrappy. They've been scrappy all year. Um. I feel like that could be the one uh, Greenbrier's offense at times has gone a little bit dormant. We've seen that they've been better of late. So we'll see which version of them we get um, this weekend or this week. So I, I could see it being an SA as the scrappy I could, that turn around. I, win. I agree. The, my only concern with NSA is they have not played the schedule that some of these other teams have played. And their record's good, and they've been winning, and they are a scrappy bunch, and they can be offensive. Guys like Gavin Angelillo, uh, Ty Howlett, um, Jace Howe, some of those guys, like they can they can be you know a, a good offensive team, but they have not played uh, they have not played the schedule that some of these other teams have played, and I don't know if they're as battle tested. That's definitely a factor, and that's what makes it tough to necessarily to say that. But if we're picking a dark horse, yeah, I mean, Greenbrier and Highland's schedules this year have been absurd to some extent. Um, for sure. They've both managed it for the most part. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to Division Three, which will probably roll through here a little bit faster. Let me run through the bracket. Uh, number one seed, Walsingham Academy. They're going to play number eight, Amelia Academy, on Tuesday. In the 4-5 matchup, you've got number four, New Community School, number five, Southampton Academy. On the other half of the bracket, you've got number three, Kenston Forest, number six, Carlisle, and then you have number two, Brunswick Academy, and number seven, Fuqua School. Uh, Bert, what are you thinking here? Is this Walsingham for the umpteenth time in a row, or is there something else that could happen here? Uh, it's tough to pick against them, honestly. It really is. Um they, you know, they've had some guys go down and they've, they've struggled at times this year, but you know, they've, when they've struggled, they've also struggled versus some VISA one teams and some really strong teams. Like they've, they, for the most part, they have taken care of the people that they should have taken care of. Um, and you know, again, I think we get to a point where like Carlisle might be the sixth seed, but Carlisle every single year, is fighting for that championship. I would not be surprised to see them run to the championship game. 
but I still see Walsingham come out of it. That might be my dark horse, Carlisle. Um, but yeah, because don't they usually get dinged? Because the, these are determined by um, coaches' votes, coaches' poll. Don't they usually get dinged because of how far out there they are? They play a bunch of like North Carolina schools. Yeah, I'm not. I, to be quite honest with you, I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I think that if they like, just say Carlisle doesn't win that first game versus Kinston. Um, if they don't win that first game, we get into a situation where it's a rivalry game uh, in terms of that of that next one. Academy but, Kenston like, Forest. NBA. Game. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a pretty heated rivalry. Um, that's that's kind of close to home, so I know how that tends to go. Um, and you, again, you're that's that's their. I don't want to say that's their season, but they're going to burn everything to get through that game and to get to that championship game. And just Walsingham, I think, is just too offensive. Um, I mean, looking at Carlisle's schedule, like, uh, to be quite honest with you, I got pretty much nothing on any of these. Um, they beat Virginia Episcopal uh, as the beginning of April. Um, they they got run ruled by Miller School. Um, so they've given they've given up some runs. Um and the better teams that they face, they have struggled to score runs. Um, and I would imagine they're making the trip to Blackstone to Kinston Forest. So, you know, sometimes when you have that travel and you're facing the other team's ace and stuff like that, some it might be too many factors. Um, but they're going to have to score some runs to beat them. All right. So we're probably ultimately thinking Walsingham again, right? I would say so. And, you know, I don't – Maybe Carlisle is like, new. Like, this is the first time I remember them being in the top eight, right? Who's that? New community. Yeah, I think it's from what I was told the other day by someone, it's like their first tournament like ever in the school's existence. I don't know how long the school's been going, um, but I think this is their first tournament game in the school's existence. Well, good for them. Hat tip to them, and they get to host it too on top of that. So not only their first tournament game, but they're playing a home game. Um, cause usually Southampton Academy is like a sneaky dark horse in here that always finds a way to win games that we don't necessarily expect them to in this playoff. Sure. Right. Yep. So, all right. Well, either way, going to be a fun day at Shepherd stadium next weekend. Um, division three semifinals are Thursday night, division one and two semifinals on Friday and Saturday, and then three championship games, bang, bang, bang in a row. Um, and that is Saturday at Shepherd Stadium. Always one of the best days for baseball in Virginia. Um, so those are our Saturday champs. Let's talk about the one that's going to get crowned on Sunday real fast here, and that's the D.C. State Athletic Association. So uh, nine teams into the tournament here. I will say right now off the top of my head, um, St. John's chose not to play in the D.C. State Tournament this year, um, which is too bad. But there's still some good teams in here. So uh, the number one seed overall is Gonzaga. Um, they'll be hosting the winner of Washington Latin and Carroll. Uh, the 4-5 matchup is number four, Jackson Reed, against number five, Murray. On the other side of the bracket, your number three seed is Sidwell Friends, playing number six, School Without Walls. And then your number two seed is St. Albans and number seven, Georgetown Day. So um, obviously you would like to think that this is probably – shaping up to be Gonzaga and St. Albans. Is there any path where you end up with a Jackson Reed or a Murray or a Sidwell friends advancing here? Do you think Bert or are the arms just too good? Uh, I mean, it's probably just a little bit too much to overcome. Honestly. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I could see like a Jackson Reed. I mean, what are they? 21, six and one. It looks like. Um, yeah. That Murray game is a little sneaky. Murray coming off of um, finishes the runners up in their conference, losing to uh, Potomac school this weekend, but they're, they're sneaky good too. So that would be an interesting game to be honest. Um, right. They were, I mean, uh, Jackson Reed was up, I think five to one on Benedictine in like the fifth or sixth inning and Benedictine came back and won that game. And that was on the road. Um, they beaten Flint Hill. They beat Bishop O'Connell. Uh, 
I mean, they've, they've had some good wins. Um, I think that's a team that you might look out for um, as far as for Jackson Reed. But honestly, like Gonzaga and St. Albans. St. Albans has stumbled down the stretch here a little bit. Uh, they're going to need to score some more runs than they've been than they had scored late, uh, lately. Um, and you know we'll see how Gonzaga bounces back and and recovers from from the WCAC loss. Yeah, no, for sure. And St. Albans has definitely been vulnerable. I mean, they they really really lean into Basso and Upchurch on the mound and have won some big games. Don't get me wrong, but a lot of those games are two one three two type affairs. Uh, they have a bit of a trouble chasing run so if someone gets up on them anything can happen so that will drift us towards on sunday at nat's youth academy where that championship will be um personally i think it's probably gonzaga that's going to win that but we could really end up with a fun pitching matchup in that sunday game if it's gonzaga and st albans where we potentially have bryce moore for gonzaga and then Upchurch and maybe even basso as well throwing for st albans so Definitely could be a lot of fun. So we'll be crowning four more champs before this podcast re-airs again next week. Um, we already have St. John's, the WCAC champ. Uh, any other notes here real quickly, Bert, that you want to throw out there? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a, like just back to DCSA a real quick. Uh, Gonzaga has like, Gonzaga has the depth and the roster talent. There's no doubt about that. Um you know, so I, I think it's going to be a tough, uh, tough road for anybody. Um, the other note that I did want to add, <clears throat> just on St. John's, they played 32 games this year. I just want everybody to think about this. 32 games, they have scored 282 runs, and they gave up 44. 44 oh, runs. What is that, 32. nine and a half to one and a half on average? Like Great division in my head? Yeah, I mean, that's like, it's just, I mean, that's just foolish. I think teams scored more than three or four runs like four times all year. Um, scored more than, scored more than two runs. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. S seven games all year, somebody scored more than two runs. And please remember, for those of you who are at public schools and are like, oh, well, some of those games aren't the best. The WCAC, there is no off days. There's no playing the last place team in the conference, which isn't very good like you see sometimes in the public schools. There are absolutely no off days. So putting that together for St. John's is actually really, really impressive. Playing three, four, five games a week and being able to run that out, to have that depth on the mound defensively to be that skilled and locked in and then offensively to just keep putting that up on a daily basis really is something. from from monday to sunday this past week they played pvi monday tuesday wednesday they played gonzaga friday and sunday they gave up five eight nine runs in those five games they gave up nine runs to paul the six three times and gonzaga twice what they score in those games? Uh, four, three, eleven, twelve, and six. That'll play. <laughs> yeah, seven, eighteen, thirty, thirty-six runs. Thirty-six to twelve against those in and, those five games against those teams. And you know the crazy part is, is like, they may be better next year. That that is true too. They somehow are they're, not losing. I mean, they're, you know, they're losing Andy Francis. They're losing uh, Andrew Powers. They're losing Thomason. Uh, but pretty much everybody else, welcome back. Definitely be interesting to see. Maybe you're maybe not. They'll be uh, doing something late March that we may or may not be involved in. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Fingers Let's crossed. See. Um. All right, so I think that's just about going to do it for us here, just real quickly, our usual update. Um, so far this season, our staff, whether it's Jason, uh, Jerry Shank, myself, or any of our PBR Mid-Atlantic Ground Forces, has been out to a total of 133 games in Virginia and D.C. this year. We've seen a total of 138 teams across that time, so uh, hoping to tick those numbers up a little bit farther. Goal is 160. I, I kind of think we're going to get there, but we'll see. 
Um, and that is where we're at. Uh, obviously, make sure you are following us on all of our socials. Um, and then make sure you keep checking back on the website for rankings updates and for all of our content that sometimes doesn't make it into the podcast. And so that's going to do it for Jason Burton and for myself. And we'll see you out there.